Acts chapter 13. Remember the whole theme of the book of Acts is that Jesus is still working uh, through his church and in the same way that he's going to work today, you know, through, through us and, and, uh, and as we leave here and, and use us, he's still working. But in particular, in chapter 13, having heard from the Holy Spirit, remember the, the focus is now moved away from Jerusalem now to Antioch as the church that sends off uh, Paul and Barnabas on this missionary journey. Uh, having heard from the Spirit, Paul and Barnabas have begun their first missionary journey together. It will be their only one together. Uh, eventually, Paul will launch off on his own with other individuals, and Barnabas and he will go their separate way. But their initial outreach, as we saw, began at Cyprus. That was Barnabas's homeland in the sense of where he had lived most of his life. And, and so they go there, and eventually it's going to take them to Asia Minor, the place where Paul will become very active in the book of Acts. Now, everywhere they go, they, they bring the gospel of Jesus Christ and the teaching of God's word. In fact, the word of God, that phrase, is mentioned more in this chapter than any other of the book of Acts, showing the, the prominent part that it played here at the very start of their ministry. This is where they began. This is what they did. You know, and that makes sense because we hear Paul instructing his protege, Timothy, later on, right before Paul's death, that last letter of 2 Timothy, and he says there in that last chapter he wrote to Timothy, he says, preach the word, you know, preach the word, because the sharing of God's word coupled with the power of God's spirit is the only thing that can change a person's life. You know, I don't know about you, but it was when God's word was spoken to me, that's what breathed life into me. You know, when God's word came in and I started to see and understand where, where I was in comparison to what God wanted, it brought conviction, it challenged me uh, in my walk with the Lord. And, and so my heart today is that it would do the same as well. So chapter 13, we're going to pick it up in verse 6. And uh, they come to Salamis first where they preach the word there. But now in verse 6 it says, and when they had gone through the isle, so they minister throughout the entire isle of Cyprus. And now they get, it says, unto Paphos. And at Paphos was the administrative center of Cyprus. It would be the, the largest city that would be there. It contained the residence of the Roman governor. It was famous for its ancient temple to Astart, later uh, converted by the Greeks to the worship of Aphrodite. So it was a, a rough town in that sense, rough city. And it mentions that there they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus, or it just means the son of Joshua, the son of Jesus. You know, Jesus' real name was Joshua. Um, Jesus is just the Greek form of, of Joshua. And so this guy here, this sorcerer, this false prophet, they find him there, and he was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So uh, they're invited to meet with this leader, but it mentions that with this guy, this guy, Sergius Paulus, was a Sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus. Now, the word sorcerer there, it's the same word used for the Magi, the ones who came to visit Jesus. Um, these were the descendants of the Chaldeans, the political advisors from Daniel's day, often seen as kingmakers and wise counselors. Uh, Pliny, the Roman historian, he wrote that the island of Cyprus in particular was overrun with these Jewish magicians who followed uh, Zoroastrianism. Um, so this guy, Elimus, you know, either he comes from this long lineage of kingmakers or, as I think Luke tends to point out here, he's just posing as one because it mentions he's a false prophet. Uh, it's my guess that he was probably a huckster, you know, a phony. He probably, you know, uh, did certain things that would legitimize his, his title, but it really, you know, wasn't who he was. Uh, but somehow he has found the ear of this governor. Uh, the word here, deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, he was the proconsul. Um, those were guys who had served previously as consuls who were the highest elected political officials in the Roman Empire. And when they had served their term and they would finish up, uh, they were the only ones who were qualified to be placed in Asia or Africa as ruling officials over a senatorial region. So this would be someone who was quite a powerful individual at one time in the Roman Empire. And it says here that he was a prudent man. He was an intelligent guy. He was a learned, educated guy. And he desired to hear the word of God. So Saul and Barnabas had to have made quite an impression in their evangelism there in the city for word to have reached this leader. And you know what I love here? Notice what he had heard about, you know? He didn't hear about, you know, just how, you know, many miracles Paul did. He didn't hear about, you know, how many, you know, awesome things, you know, how big the, the church was that was started there in Paphos or something along those lines. He wanted to hear the word of God. 
He had heard some things that had piked his attention and he wanted to hear more about them. And that's what people need, guys. You know, we don't have to have all the answers to all the things out there that we as Christians sometimes get stumbled by. They need to hear the word of truth. They need to hear the word of God. That's the thing that's going to change their life. So let's give it to them. Well, it mentions here in, in verse 8, but Elimus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, he withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Apparently, as uh, Saul and Barnabas are sharing with this guy Sergius. Um, he's really responding well to the sermon or the message or the, the answers that they're giving to his questions. And as they're sharing the word of God, then this guy begins to interject himself. He begins to withstand Paul and Barnabas. The word there means to actively apply pressure or power. He begins to now try to mislead, to turn away the Sergius from the truth. Well, Sergius, you know, you know, that's not, you know, that's not all the truth. Let me share some things with you that I've heard about this guy, Jesus. And so as this, he's trying to keep this guy from coming to faith, Paul sees that. And so verse 9 says, Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. He starts to bear, bore a hole in this guy's face. You know, he, he just stares at him. He's like, you know, really? <laughs> he just begins to set his eyes on him. And he's, you know, I can imagine he's probably thinking, Lord, what, you know, we got to do something about this guy. You know, I, I, he's, he's getting in the way. Now, real quick, I, we passed over it quickly because uh, it just says it almost inconsequentially. Then Saul, who is also called Paul. Um, from this point forward, Saul will be called Paul in the book of Acts. Now, why the name change? Well, growing up in the Hellenistic city of Tarsus and being a natural-born Roman citizen, it required Paul to have both a Greek and a Hebrew name. In fact, he would have three Greek names. Uh, we don't know what the other two would have been. But he came to be known as Paul because his ministry was primarily to Greek speakers. He was ministering outside of the realm of Judaism for the most part. And as a result, that's how he came to be known. So it just right here, Luke begins to call him Paul because that was the name that more people would recognize him by. And it mentions here that he was filled with the Holy Ghost. The word there means to being completely filled. He was filled to the brim with the Spirit at this moment in time. And to be honest, I don't know if I could ever say something like he's about to say unless I was sure I was 100% filled with the Spirit at this moment, you know? I remember I taught this one time and someone said, that's what we need more of. We need to tell people off, you know? And I thought, well, I don't know about that, you know? You know, I, I don't know if we need to go walk around making people blind. Maybe that's the new ministry we're supposed to have. Calvary Chapel make you blind if you don't get saved. You know, I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm not signing up for that, but, uh, you know, he, he was filled with the Spirit, so he could say this correctly. You know, you, you, the Bible talks about be angry and sin not. How hard is that to do, though, right? I don't know about you, but most of the time, if I'm angry, I'm in sin. <laughs> you know, there are those moments, I know, you know, when you see something wrong and it just, this righteous anger wells up where you just, it's for the wrongdoing and not at a person. But most of the time, when I'm mad, I'm mad at somebody. And it's hard. And I think it would be hard to do this as well, uh, what Paul's about to do. So I don't know if this is necessarily an example of how we should do evangelism. But filled with the Holy Ghost, he set his eyes on him and he said to him, oh, full of all subtlety. And in contrast to Paul being filled with the Spirit, Eliamus is full of, he's full of something else and, and it's of subtlety. He's of, of mischief. The word there, subtlety, means to deceive by using trickery. Mischief means fraud or villainy. You know, I mean, he's, this guy's a crook, basically. He's, he's absolutely false. He calls him, you child of the devil. You enemy of all righteousness. There was one time I did this. Um, my wife thought I was a little insane. Well, I had, my neighbor had just gotten saved. Uh, he was a pretty rough, pr pretty rough guy. He had just gotten saved, and his, his sister, who he lived with, was saved, and, uh, and we would talk all the time. And, and, and this guy, you know, he was he's kind of having, you know, he had a rough time, and, and then he got saved. And, and so I would get home, and, and he'd be out working in the yard, and, and I'd get home from work, and I'd come out, and he told me, he said, I gave my life to Christ. And so we started having these conversations. Baby Christian, though, didn't know the word, and so I'm just pouring into him and encouraging him and, you know, trying to, you know, just challenge him in his walk with the Lord. And about three weeks after, you know, he got saved, I was home one day. It was a Saturday and I, I looked out the window and I saw him coming, Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and, and Jehovah's Witnesses were there and, and I see him coming that way and I see he's out in the yard and I'm thinking, no, no, he doesn't know any better at this point. They're going to get him, you know? And, and, and so I come running out the, the you know, the, the door and I'm like, no, no, David, don't listen to him. These guys are false prophets, you know? And then of course, 
Yeah, I wanna know if I'd do that, but again. But that's, I just, my heart was just so broken for this guy and I didn't want him to be deceived. And so, you know, I just, I just, I wanted the attention to be on me. You know, come over here and talk to me. You know, don't mess with a baby. And, uh, and, and it worked. <laughs> they were not happy with me. So, you know, and they came over and wanted to come talk to me. And, and, uh, and that was fine. So, uh, you know, and then I got to talk to him afterwards. And I says, beware, you know, not everybody who names the name of Christ is his, you know. And, uh, but I wouldn't recommend doing that for the most part. <laughs> you enemy of all righteousness. Will you not cease to pervert or lead people astray from the right ways of the Lord? And you know, it's interesting, that last part there, there's grace there. Because this is a legitimate question designed to give Elimus one last shot to repent before God intervenes. Elimus, unfortunately, doesn't take it. And says in verse 11, and now behold, and that, that phrase, and now behold, it, it shows you there was a pause there. How, are you going to continue to try to lead people astray when you know it's not even true? Oh, okay, I guess you're going to go there. Then fine. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. That's a Greek euphemism for blindness. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Now, this might seem harsh, you know, but realize Paul did give him an opportunity to repent. You know, the Lord loves everybody, but man, don't come between him and those that want to know him. Don't ever come between him and those that want to know him. You know, Jesus said it'd be better for that person to put a millstone around their neck and throw themselves into the sea. And I don't think he was being exaggerating. I don't think he was being facetious. Don't get in the way of me and my people. That's one of the most dangerous things about the idea that there's any other mediator between Jesus. You are coming between him and his bride. He says, don't, don't get in my way. <laughs> I died so nothing would be in the way. I died so that veil could be torn in two and that you could enter in. So don't get in the way. You know, I am not your mediator. Sorry to disappoint you. You can go right to Jesus. You can open up your Bible and he can teach you each and every day. He can speak to your heart. You can hear his voice. He says, my sheep hear my voice, right? And I am known of them and they're known by me. That relationship that's there. You know, I always just say, well, you know, what, what, is a, what are leaders then? We're just sheep dogs, you know? We just kind of, Point people to Jesus, you know? That's all we are. You know, hey, you bark at them a little bit because they're getting off, off track. You know, get back on track, you know? You know, Jesus, he said it'd be better for you to put a millstone, but God is being merciful here, blinding him like he did because, you know, it's interesting, that's what he did to Paul, didn't he? Blinded him to get his attention. God could have wiped him out right here, but he didn't. Verse 12, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, he believed, being astonished. But notice what he's astonished at, the doctrine of the Lord. Isn't that awesome? It was the teaching. In the end, it was God's teaching, the, the teaching of God's word that moved him to salvation. You know, that, this miracle was just kind of the final nudge he needed to push him over to a decision. And sometimes, you know, we want to be profound. You know, we want to say something, you know, magnificent, something that will, you know, be the thing that they need to hear that will, you know, turn them over and make them all of a sudden go, oh, I need to repent and receive Christ. You know, but even Jesus said that any miraculous signs, they just follow after our preaching of the word. God knows if someone needs that miracle to give them a, a final nudge. But our goal, our focus is to preach the word, right? To, to share the truth with them. That's what our goal is. Well, we move on from here. Verse 13 says, Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they pardon me, came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, You men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So they sail now, they set sail from Cyprus to the southern central area or western central area of Asia Minor, and they land there in Perga in Pamphylia. Perga was the religious capital of ancient Pamphylia. Uh, it housed a renowned temple to Artemis, uh, but no preaching is mentioned here. In fact, the only major event that's recorded in Perga is John Mark's deserting the company to return to Jerusalem. 
And I use the word deserting because that's how Paul saw it. Uh, why did he leave? We don't know. The historically passed down reason is that this trip was just too Gentile for him. He, he, he thought, man, I, you know, I, I got into Cyprus and you know, we saw the Aphrodite stuff and that was too much. And now he, he gets to Perga and he sees the temple of Artemis. And he's like, I'm done. I, I, this is way too Gentile for me. I'm going back where everything's kosher. I, I'm going home to mom. And because, uh, you know, his mom, of course, that's where the church met in Jerusalem, his mom's house. Uh, you know, some people have accused him. I think it was Chris Ostrom said he just missed his mom. Uh, I don't know if that's the case, but uh, we don't know why, but he did leave and it greatly upset Paul to the point that Paul did not want him coming again with him. He said, no, that guy's a deserter. He came along because we needed help and he was our personal assistant and I'm not taking him again because he was unfaithful. We'll get to that in Acts and maybe I'll talk about that then. Uh, Paul's an interesting cat, you know. You know I love the Bible, because you know, I look at it and I go, I'm not so bad. <laughs> the stuff I think sometimes, the stuff I do sometimes, I'm like, they were just like me, you know. They had, they had attitude problems and they had false expectations, you know, and, and blew it sometimes. And, uh, you know, I, I love that about the heroes of, of our Bible. That's, you know, tonight we're going to look at Abraham and, you know, Abraham's the father of our faith, right? <laughs> He had some issues too, so, well. Well, from here they travel as John leaves, and in verse 14 they depart from Perga. They come to Antioch and Pisidia, and this is one of those 16 Antiochs that were founded by the Seleucid Empire uh, before Rome defeated them, whereupon uh, when Rome took over, this became the capital of southern Galatia, one of their, the Roman provinces. And it says they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, that's their normal thing to do, and they sat down, and after the reading of the law and the prophets, so going through the normal uh, steps of the synagogue worship service. Uh, they saw Paul and Barnabas here, these leaders, and they sent unto them saying, you men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation, hey, for the, tell us, you know? I mean, we are so honored to have you here as our guests. Um, this would not be uncommon for traveling visitors if you came from afar. Hey, what's going on? Has the Lord taught you anything? Can you share with us? Um, however, uh, it was especially normal for Paul considering that he was a renowned rabbi and a former member of the Sanhedrin. And when you saw Paul, and he, and he was, a, you know, the word Paul actually means little or little one or diminutive one. He was most uh, historical you know, renditions of Paul, label him as about five feet tall. He's a short guy. You know, you kind of, when you see him getting all crazy, you know, you kind of picture him with short, you know, it's kind of, you know, kind of comical when you think about what God did. But um, he was very recognizable. And so as a result, they saw this is Paul that's here. And so he would always be invited to speak. Uh, many synagogues, they were just delighted to give an opportunity to share with them. And you know, uh, Paul took full advantage of this. Um, having this open door to share anywhere he went uh, shows how much sense it made to come to the synagogue first because not only would then he be able to have an open door to preach the gospel to the Jews who were there, which was his heart first, but any God-fearing Gentiles would provide the bridge to reach the city. He could start with them, those who are already interested in the God of the Bible, those who are already interested in, in uh, the, the God of the Israelites. He would be able to preach to them as well and then use that as a bridge to reach the rest of the city. Um, you know, being dependent upon the Holy Spirit doesn't mean we don't make good plans for reaching the lost. You know, I think it's our good plans in the sense of as we pray and we seek the Lord and he lays things on our heart and then we plan things out and lay them at his feet and ask him to alter them if he wants and, and then we move forward in a step of faith. Well, verse 16, Paul stood up and he beckoned with his hand. He's, he's ready to give this oration. And he says, men of Israel and you that fear the Lord, give audience. Ye that fear God, this would refer to those Gentile listeners who hadn't become Jewish proselytes yet. They were interested, but they didn't feel like getting circumcised or keeping all the dietary laws, but they were interested in their God. And so he addresses both groups, which would be not normal. And he addresses both of them and he says, give audience audience, which means it's imperative in the Greek, which is a command, which means you must listen to what I have to say. In other words, I, I don't have a, I don't have a, I do have a word of exhortation. It's the most important word you'll ever hear. So perk up. This is important. And you know what, guys, we have the most important message mankind needs to hear. Amen. It's the most important message. Don't ever give in to the lie of the enemy who says, oh, they don't want to hear this or don't bother them with that or they're too busy right now. We have a glorious gospel and it is the power of God into salvation. Nothing else. It's what people need to hear. You know, in Romans chapter one, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel 
For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, in that gospel message, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You know, it's important. And we should never be ashamed of sharing it with somebody. Now, this is the first recorded sermon of Paul that we have in the Scriptures. And it's long, but it's fascinating because of its similarities to the sermon Peter uh, preached on Pentecost. It's so similar. And it shows you that the early church, they, when they were preaching the gospel, they hit certain things. If you're ever called upon any time to, to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, you need to hit certain things. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. So Paul says, give ear, give audience. And then he says, he begins, verse 17, the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with a high arm, he brought, him, uh, brought he them out of it. And about the time of 40 years, he suffered their manners in the wilderness. You know, uh, it says that he suffered their manners. And I usually think of suffering somebody means I need to put up with them. But the word there can also mean to care for. And you know, what? I'm so glad that God does both those things. I'm so glad that he puts up with, with a lot for me and he still loves me, and he still cares for me. I'm so glad that his heart is always toward me. Aren't you glad for God's patient care in your life? God is so good. He put up with them, but he also cared for them in the midst of putting up with them. You know, some people we just put up with, but the Lord doesn't, he doesn't just put up with. He loves us dearly and deeply. It says uh, in verse 19, and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. So he's giving them a history lesson here. And after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they desired a king. And so God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. So he takes them from all the way back to uh, the beginning of their time in Egypt, all the way up to David. And, and the idea that he's trying to convey here is, is to show that God had a goal. And each step that he took with them, he bore with them and cared for them. He had a goal in mind. And the goal was where he said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. David is held in this high esteem and, you know, every wonderful event in Israel's history, even something so grand as David, though, it all led to a man who would truly fulfill all of God's desire. It all led to the ultimate goal of sending the Messiah. And so Paul proclaims, now he starts here in verse 23, he says, of this man's seed, David, has God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. And so Paul explains, you know, we have this rich history of God and of, of doing all these things for us, and yet in each and every movement of where we were in our history, it was all to bring us to this point of Jesus. And so Paul proclaims, that's why I'm here. I'm here to announce that God's goal is finally achieved. Jesus has come. Now, this would catch them a little off guard. You know, it'd be like all of a sudden me showing up and going, hey, Jesus came back today. Now, you'd know I was a false prophet because we're here. But the point being is that, you know, that's the type of seriousness of the announcement that the Messiah has come. These are the things that was the hope of every Jew. The Messiah has come. Well, how come I didn't know about it yet? You know, why am I just finding out about it from you? And so Paul, they, they probably heard some stories, but not the full story. And so after dropping this bomb on them, Paul is going to explain. He's going to give them the full rundown. And he starts right at the beginning with John the Baptist, someone they would all have heard of as well and be very familiar with. So verse 24 says, Now when John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom do you think that I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Now, this would be something they had heard, something they were familiar with. As they would make that trek and that trip to Jerusalem, they would have heard about this guy out in the desert who's saying the Messiah is coming. So it, he's building this argument and, and showing, you know, that, that as he's introduced Jesus to them, it's not just his idea that John the Baptist had said that he was not the Messiah, but he was preparing the way for the Messiah. And therefore, this is a word of exhortation, but it's so much more. It's a word of salvation. And so in verse 26, he says, men and brothers, 
children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you that fears God, to you is this word, pardon me, this word of salvation sent to you, he says. Not just to the world, but to you, the individuals that were sitting there, the Gentile God-fearers and the Jewish believers, the Jewish people who were there, it was for them. The gospel is personal. He's saying God, is, he loves you dearly and deeply, and he wants you to hear this message of salvation. If you're here today, do you, do you know that God loves you? That you're not here by mistake? That he cares about you? That he's intimately interested in your life? That he doesn't want you to go down paths that aren't good for you? That he doesn't want you to perish if you don't know him? Well, if the message is personal, it means it also must be received personally. You know, you can't hang on to someone else's faith by joining uh, them in their church attendance or in other religious activities that they do. You know, Paul brings this point up because he's about to explain to them that, you know, everybody didn't accept Jesus. In fact, their own rulers, their own religious leaders killed him. Verse 27. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers because they knew him not. Notice he doesn't say our rulers. Their rulers because they knew him not, yet, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day. They have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. You know, here's where the gospel message starts. It starts with Jesus' sinless life. Jesus, who was the promised one, the one that John prophesied of, and now we see here the one who was killed according to the scriptures. Those that dwelt in Jerusalem, even though they read every day, every Sabbath day, they read the, the words of the prophets, they can't hear their voice. It says, for they that dwelt in Jerusalem, it says they did not know him. They did not know him. Why? Well, <laughs> the same reason that... Uh, it is today that people don't know him. Ignorance is still the great slayer of faith in Christ, and it's why we need to go. It's why we need to tell others. You know, we're going to have two mission trips this summer, and we're going to try to bring the word to places that haven't heard about Jesus, you know? I want to encourage you, you know? Think about how, how, what it means for you to go, you know? Maybe for you to go might mean to support, you know, one of the young people or, or other older people that might be going, you know? Maybe it might be your part to play, be to pray every day for one of those people that's going down there. Maybe to pray in preparation. Or maybe it's to go yourself. But the point being is that we all need to recognize that there are people who need to hear about the Lord. People need the word. They need to learn the truth about Jesus and their need for salvation, and what's fascinating is by their ignorance of the scriptures, they ended up fulfilling them, these religious leaders, thus proving that Jesus was the Messiah, the very one that they didn't want anybody to hear that he was. You know, what does the Bible say? That if they knew, you know, if they understood, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory, right? They didn't have a clue. They didn't know their own scriptures. And so, though they found no cause of death in him, yet they desired that from Pilate that he would be slain. There was no legal grounds for Jesus' accusation he lived a sinless life, but he also paid the price for us with his substitutionary death. And so when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and they laid him in a tomb. But praise God, he didn't stay there. Verse 30, the, Jesus' is sinless life, that's an important part of the gospel message, is substitutionary death. That's an important part when you're preaching the gospel to somebody. But thirdly, his supernatural resurrection. In verse 30, Peter, Paul moves on, he says, but God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And this would be the hardest thing for them to conceive. What, they, they killed him? Well, but yeah, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. God raised him from the dead. Well, dead is dead, right? I mean, you, you don't come back from the dead. And Paul will spend the rest of his sermon proving that the Messiah would die and rise again. And so he says here, listen, he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. For any claim or any, any legal grounds of anything in Jewish culture, two witnesses were required for any Jewish testimony. To be received in, in any type of legal grounds, he had to have at least two witnesses. So before even going into the, what the Bible prophesied in the Old Testament, Paul explains that there are plenty of witnesses. If you want to go ask them, go ask them. They saw. 
But beginning in verse 32, he begins to show them the proof from the scriptures. And so he says, we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto our fathers, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. Now, the first thing that he would need to explain is how can a man rise from the dead? We had to explain the nature of Jesus because he's not just a man. In Psalm chapter 2, if you want to turn there, you can with me real quick. It's uh, Psalm 2 verse 7 is where the quote comes from. But I'd like to read to you the whole psalm. It's short. It's only 12 verses. Well, actually just up to verse 7 at least. And you can keep your finger in Psalms because we're going to go there one more time. Actually, I'm going to read the whole psalm. I think it's cool. There's so many neat things in here. But uh, Psalm verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, Messianic psalm, very clear as we read through it. He says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and their rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed one. The word there means his Christ, his Messiah, you know, against the Lord Jehovah and against his Messiah, saying, let us break not his, but their bands asunder. So it's not just talking about God the Father, but here we're going to see in a moment God the Son as well. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Do what you want, basically the Lord saying, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And I will declare the decree. The Lord said unto me, you are, what does it say? My son, this day have I begotten you. Now, that thought was just something so foreign to the Jewish people of that day, that God would have a son, that that, that this idea of a trinity, it wasn't something that was not understood in antiquity, but in this current day, this was so foreign to them. And it's not the only reference. It goes on, and he says, ask of me, referring to God saying, the Father saying to the Son, ask of me, and I shall give you the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So therefore, be wise now, O you kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord, Jehovah, the God the Father with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. The Son is mentioned twice in this psalm. See, he's not just a man. He's God in the flesh. And therefore, he can rise from the dead because dead, death has no sway over the one who is almighty God, right? It has no hold on him. Every Jew would know this passage is messianic. Every Jew, they would think and they would call their attention to this passage. You are my son. This day have I begotten you. Wait a second. Paul clearly demonstrates that the Messiah would be God's son and that he would become a man. And having established this point, he returns to showing how the resurrection was prophesied as well. So verse 34. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Now we read that in our scripture reading. That's from Isaiah 55. But reading those first six verses that we read today of Isaiah 55, it makes it clear again. It's messianic. It talks about the Lord's anointed one again. And the messianic promises are directly tied to God's promises to David. And so at verse 35, he says, Wherefore, he says also in another psalm, You shall not suffer your Holy One to see corruption. And this is Psalm 16. So if you just flip a few pages over to Psalm 16, and we see here, David in verse 10, he says, For you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. But I'd actually like to start in verse 5 and just read through to that verse to give us some context of why he says it and what it means. In verse 5, David says, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. You maintain my lot. The lions are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. When I die, I'm not going to have a worry in the world. For you will not leave my soul in hell, 
neither will you suffer your holy one to see corruption. You know, David, this here includes a personal promise to him that he had received from the Lord. I'm not going to stay in the dirt. I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm going to be with him someday. And yet the key promise is that the Messiah, God's holy one, he wouldn't even stay in the grave long enough to experience physical corruption, decomposition. He'd rise from the dead very quickly to never die again. For verse 36 says, Paul goes on, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, he fell on sleep, he died. And he was laid unto his fathers, and he did see corruption, his body decomposed. But he whom God raised again, he saw no corruption, no decomposition. And so in verse 38, having talked to them about the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, he now explains what Jesus accomplished by it, by his life, death, and resurrection. And he says, be it known unto you, therefore, because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And you know what? If, if there's nothing you can come away with today, two things I want to leave with you today. And it's from verses 38 and 39. Number one, because Paul says, why, why I say you need to know this? Because he says, you must know this. Be it known unto you. It's imperative again. You must know this. And what is it? That Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection, he secured the forgiveness of sins for you and me. Hmm. The word forgiveness is a beautiful word in the Greek. It means to send off or away. And it came to mean to remove the guilt from wrongdoing, to bring about a pardon, a full pardon for someone who was a criminal. And you know what? We must know this. We must have a grip on this. We must understand this. When you put your faith in Christ, all of your sins are forgiven, not just some of them, all of your sins. And God removes all of the guilt and he gives you a complete pardon. He's never angry with you again. Isn't that a great benefit of our salvation? Isn't it a great thing that Jesus accomplished for us, our wonderful forgiveness? But secondly, in verse 39, he says, and by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. I don't know about you, but I go through that list. It doesn't take long for me to be busted. I mean, you know, I, I, again, you just start with the Ten Commandments. And, and you, you know the reaction of the Jewish people when they heard the Ten Commandments for the first time? God takes them out into the desert, of course. They, flee, they finally break free of, of, of Pharaoh. They go out to Mount Sinai, and here's thunder and lightnings, and a cloud descends upon the top of the mountain. You know, so much so that a, a part of the mountain is like charred away. I mean, just God's there and his magnificence and his holiness and his power. And now his voice starts to declare there the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. You shall have no other gods before me. You know what Israel did? It says they ran. They ran. They ran and they hid behind their tents. And they said, Moses, uh, we, we don't want to hear his voice. You go talk to him. Because you know what every one of them was thinking? You shall not lie. I'm dead. <laughs> I, I mean, you're, you're, you're two in. You're going, I'm crispy crittered. You know, that thing that's destroying that mountain up there that stood for God knows how many years is now going to come after me. And it would go through one by one by one by one. And the realization would hit, I haven't done any of that. By him, all that believe are justified from all that stuff that we fail. Isn't that awesome? All it is is belief. What does that mean? It means to place one's complete trust and reliance upon something or someone. That's the condition of salvation. You must no longer trust in your own works to get you into heaven. All your hope, all your future rests upon what Jesus did on the cross for you. And here we see for the first time mentioned the word justified. By him all that believe, all that believe are justified. It means to declare righteous, to declare right. You know, not only does God pardon our sin, but he transfers Christ's perfect, sinless, righteous life to us. That's why his sinless life is such an important part of the gospel. He takes that sinless, perfect, righteous life where he did everything that God required. When God looked at him on the Mount of Transfiguration, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's the righteousness that you are clothed with. That's the righteousness that you are clothed with. And I don't feel that way. I wake up daily and I, I don't feel that way at all. You know, the alarm went off this morning. I want to get up and really pray. I mean, we need, wait, I need to pray. I had snooze. <laughs> it 
It didn't take me but four seconds to be in the flesh. And I'm righteous. That contradiction. Wow. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, right? All things have passed away. All things have become new. If you know the Lord today, that's who you are. It's what you are. It's what he's done. And how righteous are we in his sight? All things. I love that. All things that you could not be justified by the law of Moses. You are completely justified. Every bit of righteousness God requires is yours in Christ. And now you have full access to the Holy of Holies to come to his throne of grace. And if that doesn't deserve an amen, nothing does. <laughs> God gave us freely what we could never ever earn by keeping his laws. And you know, that would be a, a huge blow to any of those who had subscribed to that ideal of the Pharisees that they could be righteous. And anyone who thought they could be righteous through following the law, that would forever lay that low. And, you know, it's a huge blow to the person who thinks they'll get to heaven by being good. That's why the gospel's offensive, guys. You know, it's offensive because, yeah, Jesus is the only way. But you know why it's offensive? I remember it, it was summed up best when I was sharing the gospel with a guy once and, and telling him about the Lord. And he said, you mean to tell me I'm a good father, I'm a good husband, I work hard, I pay my taxes, I'm a good citizen. You know, I do all these things. I go to my son's t-ball games. And you're telling me that if some drunk on the, in, in the gutter repents of his sins and puts his faith in Christ, that he's going to go to heaven and I'm going to go to hell? And I said, yep. Because your greatest problem that you don't even see is your pride and your self-righteousness. You don't recognize all the areas that you fall short. Remember Jesus, the rich young ruler came to him? Hey, you gotta love Jesus, right? What must I do to be saved? Yeah, keep the whole law, man. <laughs> now you would think any rational person would go, oh no, you know, I, I can't do that, I'm in trouble. Is there any other way? Well, let me tell you. No, you know what this guy goes? I've kept it all from my youth. And Jesus is thinking, wow, that's a proud man. Tell you what, take everything you got, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. Then you can do it. Covetousness. He had sin that he didn't even know, and Jesus laid it low right there. Our pride, so dangerous. You know, it, the gospel tells me I'm not good and that I need a savior. And so, where do you stand? Paul's going to give a warning at the end of the sermon, but I, I kind of want to bridge that over to next week and because the reaction that we're going to get is not a good one. Uh, from some, many people there will be. And, and that may be the case this morning. If you don't know the Lord this morning, you know, maybe uh, your reaction is like, well, I, I, I am a good person. I try my best. You know, I hear from unbelievers all the time, I, tr I try not to hurt anybody. That's how I know I'm going to go to heaven. Or I, I try to be good, you know. And, and the problem is, is that doesn't offend anybody because that standard is different for every person you talk to. You know, I, I used to hear from people when I was in high school and I'd share the gospel with them, I, I'm not Hitler. Like, that's like, like you get a bonus for that, you know? You know, you, you get an award. I am not as bad as Hitler, you know? Praise God. You're just an amazing individual, you know? You know? <laughs> There's none righteous, no, not one. That can't be watered down a bit because we need to come to the understanding. Maybe some of you, maybe you're a young person today, you've grown up in church. Your Christianity is, is kind of, yeah, well, yeah, I do good things. And, uh, listen, you need to come to the realization that there's none good. No, not one. There's none that seeks after God. And when we come to that and we receive his grace and his goodness because he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, we really start to walk in all that God has for us. So if you don't know the Lord this morning, I want to challenge you. Repent. You know, repent. Acknowledge that you fall short. And put all your hope and all your eggs in Jesus' basket because he's the only one who can take care of them. Amen? Let's all stand. And join me in prayer as the worship team comes forward. I know we ran late today, so please get your kids quickly, but the gospel is an important thing to talk about, so I felt like it was important. So join me in prayer. Lord, you are so worthy. And we are not, we, and not in ourselves, that is. Lord, we find our worth in the love that you've set upon us. We find our righteousness, of course, in you, in your free gift. 
So Lord, this morning, maybe we've been proud with a spouse, or maybe we've been proud in just our, our lives, or maybe, you know, even grown up, you know, as a, a person in church, we become proud and, you know, just we think we're okay. And Lord, we want to have a moment with you right now where we recognize I'm not okay. <laughs> Me, in and of myself, is never okay. Lord, by your grace, we are justified. And as justified people who have already given our lives to you, Lord, we want to recognize each and every day our daily need for you, for our sanctification as well. It's all you, always only Jesus. <laughs> it's all you. So we just yield our lives to you, our hearts to you now. With every eye closed, every head bowed, maybe this morning, you don't know the Lord. You've never repented of your sins and put your faith in Christ. If you would like to receive the Lord Jesus, would you just raise your hand high? Raise your hand high. Amen. Anybody else this morning? Anybody else? You'd like to repent of your sins and put your faith in Christ. You've never done that before. You want to be done fighting with the Lord. You just want to receive the Lord this morning. Anybody else before we close? Hmm. Lord, even now, we just, uh, once again, we recommit ourselves to you. We say, oh, we repent. <laughs> even as Job said, I repent of myself. Lord, we are not righteous in our own efforts, but Lord, you have made us righteous. And so now, Lord, for, for those who are receiving you, those who have said, I, I repent of my sins and I want to put my faith in Christ, would you forgive them, Lord? Would you wash them and cleanse them and make them your child? And Lord, we thank you for those, uh, all of us, Lord, who have received you already. Lord, we thank you for our righteousness that you have given to us. We thank you for that forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.